three. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we are, Danny. Wonderful. Well, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, to the Michael and Danny show again, and we have a very very special guest today. Uh, you know, he has mastered countless, countless records. Uh, you, in all likelihood, have many, many of his amazing records. And of course, the man that I'm speaking of is none other than Kevin Gray. Uh, you know, Kevin, you and I have known each other for what, almost 20 years, I want to say. It's been a long um, time, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, I was trying to figure when we first met, and I think... If I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Kavi and I were driving with one inch master tapes to your old studio. Right. To get the meeting by the river. Right. On Tim's famous C36 or C37. C37 one inch. Yeah. And that yep. was that was when we first met, which is now what, 2002, three? When was that? I don't remember. I think I actually had met you prior to that in one of the rooms that's at, you know, what either CES or one of the audio shows. Um, I think it was, um, who's the guy that has uh, uh, the audio company up near Camarillo, uh, up near? Oh, um, wait, uh, uh, gosh. It uh, it's really kind of near, neither here nor there, but I think yeah. that actually is where I first met you. Could be. <laughs> Could very well be. Um, you know, thanks so much for, for taking the time to join us. You know, obviously, My pleasure. Uh, you know, Michael Ludwig's uh, has has really kicked off this whole vinyl community uh, into high gear with with phenomenal content over the last year. And Thank Michael you. and I met about six months ago. And, you know, we, we kind of put some ideas together uh on on how we can take things to the next level and you know feature mm -hmm. some really incredible guests and you know i started my own channel uh you know about a month ago and i figured hey you know what i, I can't think of a person that i'd love to have more on than kevin so thanks for for making the well, time you. to join us and you know look forward to a great discussion all right. I think, my, the, my I, I think the only way we can top this is elvis presley <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I I actually have contacts with him, but I can't talk about that. <laughs> so but he's we, alive. We, 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 we got to wait for the it. government to release their UFO stuff first. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. right. Yeah, but uh, but then you you just hit hit something. Uh, I I looked up over at Discogs and and type in the name Kevin Gray, and there are two thousand three hundred and forty seven uh, 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 vinyls. You. Is that all? <laughs> that all? That all? Just kidding. Oh, that's that's uh, of course quite something. And maybe Discox has been good to me. They actually contact me directly with questions sometimes, which I really appreciate. You know. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe let's start. Let's start with a question. Uh, um, uh, um, a very special question. I would love to ask you since since a very long sure. time. You know, I put out for starters three records. Analog production, Lee Morgan, the side Love one. that record. Master engineer, guess who? Kevin Gray. Music matters jazz. SRX version, Lee Morgan, the sidewinder. Master right. engineer, Kevin Gray. <laughs> Blue Note, classic series. <laughs> Lee Morgan, the sidewinder. Master engineer, Kevin Gray. Um, the most well, that's why I've mastered 350 blue notes. I just keep doing the same titles over and over again. Mm -hmm. but, but what? So this this has been done over the years. Is there something as a detectable tape degradation? You can detect how handled. Is it there? Is it not there? What what can you tell us about this topic? I haven't really noticed much in the way of tape deterioration. I mean, those old Scotch 111 tapes. Uh, mm -hmm. If the oxide doesn't flake off of them, which can happen with improper storage, they seem to go forever. Um, you know, uh, I suppose things could happen to them, but uh, um, Capital's been storing them very, very well. So, uh, yeah, it hasn't really been an issue. 
And, and, and how does this tapes get to you? Hand, FedEx hand or, delivered or FedEx by messenger. Or, or, or <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're messengered from the Capitol Tower. Uh, we work with a guy named Jack Arenas over there. He's mm -hmm. a wonderful archivist and knows what they've got. And always, you know, if there's a question about, well, which one do you think is, is really the master? Because sometimes there are some labeling questions. Anyway, uh, he's, he's really good about that. And, and he's really good about making sure that they get to me and that they get back safely. You know, it, it, interesting you bring that up, Kevin. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the big sort of pet peeves of mine that, that I've uh, talked about countless times is when you look at, for example, the movie industry uh, and how they store their film vis-a-vis uh, -vis how, you know, the, the music industry stores master tapes, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even talking about digital files. Uh, I, I'm just strictly looking at physical media. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I see stark differences and you just sort of alluded to one of them, which is, well, you know, I, I, I don't know, was this the master tape? Was this the master tape? Is this a dub? Right. Was this a safety? Whereas on the film side of things, you know, I sincerely doubt Christopher Nolan is going to be in a vault trying to figure out, mm, gee, I wonder, was this the real right. shot or is this a copy, right? Right. There, uh, you know, historically speaking, can, can you add a little color to that for us? I mean, what's what's the story there? Well, um, well, first of all, I should mention that I wasn't referring to the Sidewinder and that type of title. I was referring to like uh, things that maybe have never been released and have maybe never been assembled. So wow. there might be two or three reels. They're not sure, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, because they, they, you know, they know on the masters, what are the master, you know, on, on, on the, the, the basic catalog stuff that's been reissued to, to date. Um, and the only other thing I really can add to that is that the other label that I also do a lot of work with and I'm vetted to receive their master tapes is, is Warner. And they're also very, very good. Maggie, my cat's getting on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're very, very good ab ab about uh, keeping track of what they've got. And they've, they've got the most amazing like fire extinguisher system and, and security for their vault. Uh, very impressive. Okay. So, so we don't really have an issue with, you know, gee, where's all the tapes? I mean, sometimes you hear horror stories. What uh, uh, Ian Anderson um, kept yeah. his tapes under his bed? Or <laughs> yes, yes. So that, I guess yeah, sometimes on, uh, it comes Aqual up. Aqualung. Yeah. Yeah. Which is sort of crazy. Oh, gee, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. I had some interesting tapes. discussions with, uh, with Ian um, yeah, back in the day. I, I can only imagine. Well, you know, that that record was apparently encoded with a Dolby A301, and he was insistent that it be played back with a Dolby A301. And I said, no problem, I got one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you just said it, you, you've done how many Blue Notes? 500? Three, well, 350 by my best count. I don't, it could be more. I know it's at least 300. Okay, at least 350, <laughs> that's quite something. Um, when but like, so, like I said, some of those were done multiple times. So I don't know if yeah. we can really count that. When, when you see this Blue Note thing, uh, I, I, I only can imagine uh, with an educated guest, when it comes to Blue Note, in a way, you have every time the same room, the same arrangement, or, or two rooms over the history, the same yes. arrangement, the same... Yeah, Hackensack uh, and Ringover Cliffs. Cliffs, yeah. That, that probably helps when if you compare it to let's say 70s 80s rock oh, right. music. oh for sure how, for sure how is the difference when when you have for example if, when you when you've done this fantastic uh, uh, fleetwood mac rumors it's quite something different isn't it? yeah that that you know that was mixed in multiple rooms and uh, that had some mm -hmm. issues and uh it was it was a bit of work <laughs> more work than doing mm -hmm. a blue note for sure i mean just to be honest um, I'm not saying that all the blue notes are easy, but but yeah, you're right. There is a consistency, and that that helps to to keep up to keep up the the standard. I, I guess I, I think that's true. Mm. I think that's true. Oh, the one other thing that I wanted to mention, <laughs> going back one step when we were talking about archiving tapes, I think the biggest frustration I have is dealing with uh, Iron Mountain, 
and I'm talking about Iron Mountain West Coast, not back in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, <laughs> they have the strangest archival system. They just, each tape has a number and that is it. It doesn't say the artist, it doesn't say the title, it doesn't say anything in, in the printout sheets that I get from them. And they cannot tell, for, well, I'm kind of telling tales out of school, but I, I do a lot of work for Concord. And they can't tell Concord which one's the master. So then Concord has to request pictures, which they send to me and say, which one's the master? Oh, it's one, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, you know, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's completely different from dealing with Warner or, or, uh, or Capital okay. or okay. Tower. Wow. It's like every company has its, its, its own, own uh, habits. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Good to know. Doesn't make it easier. But when, you know, Danny and me, we really talked about a lot of, of the development within in the last years. You know, you probably are in, in, in the same position. If you compare 2020, 2021 with, let's say, 2010 in your workflow, how, how, how different is it? What, what has changed? Oh, it, well, it's funny that I, I think you mentioned 2010. That was actually when I opened Coherent Audio. Mm -hmm. um, so that was when I moved from Camarillo, from Acoustic to, to my own business. And uh, things have just gone 180. Um, around very shortly after opening, uh, I was still getting a lot of analog tapes in 2010. By 2015, I was getting almost entirely digital files and no master tapes. Okay. And now it swung back the other way again. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I do occasionally jobs from, from high res digital. People aren't sending me CDs anymore, which is good. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I'd say it's like uh, 85, 15, you know, and that's probably what it was wow. in 2010, but it was like 15, 85 in, in 2015. So yeah, anyway, it's, did so I say Kevin, that right? you know, walk us through the process, if you don't mind of, you know, I, I, know. I think everyone, would love to get your perspective on, you know, Kevin gets the tape, now what, right? What's the process you go through of, you know, mastering, remastering, cutting the lacquer? Is it like consistent across all tapes and all catalog no. titles? What, what's the story there? Well, um, I've said before that it, if I, we're talking about reissues mostly, um, if I can get an original copy of the album, uh, a, a good clean one, that's always nice. Doesn't always happen. So sometimes I'm totally on my own and sometimes I'm trying to match it. And sometimes I'm kind of trying to match it or, or keep the essence of it, but maybe bring it forward a couple of decades or more mm -hmm. um, so that it sounds good on an audiophile system, you know, because so much stuff in, in the 50s and 60s, and I'm talking here mostly about pop rock. Uh, not not jazz or classical, mm -hmm. but uh, you know they wanted to make it sound good on on cheap players, and they wanted to make it sound good on the radio. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just the singles that got EQ'd that way. The whole album, you know, would have a fairly heavy mid range bump. Often, I'm mm -hmm. not saying always, but on a lot of the the multi track rock stuff from let's say '67 through '70, '71, '72 in mm -hmm. that range. So you know, sometimes I tone them down a little bit in the mid range. Sometimes I allow more bass to go through because they would filter them to make sure they didn't skip on, you know, cheap players. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and sometimes they would be compressed. And if the compression was done in mastering, I either back off on that or eliminate it entirely um, to, to try to make it more dramatic, more, more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, do, do you, I mean, it, it sounds like, I guess it's, it's obviously, you know, dependent very much from, from release to release where, you know, it's not like a, a one, one size fits all approach. Um, right. You know, what is like, I, and I don't know if you can share this with us, but you know, what is like from memory, a title that you worked on where the tape sounded nothing like the record and oh, you had to invest a ton of effort into tweaking and adjusting. To uh, you just held right. one up. You just held one up. Uh, Rumors was a good example of that. Really? really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of EQ on that record. No um, kidding. 
Yeah. That's interesting. And it sounds and, and fantastic. It's, <laughs> it's mostly yeah. just to balance things up from track to track. You know, one song would mm -hmm. be bass heavy, one would be bass light. Okay. Uh, you know, some would have, you know, nice clear treble, other ones were kind of muffled. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That 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 leads me to 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 a very for me very interesting question. You know, mastered by Kevin Gray is one of the trademarks, at least when it comes to to ask all your files who wants the best pressing possible. Can there be the, a situation because you you are probably aware of it where you get a tape or has that occurred and you say no sorry this. I can't do a Kevin Gray remaster uh, all of this tape. Well, I, I do give the label a heads up that it's not going to sound like what people would probably expect out of me, but I've never really turned one away. Oh, cool. I, I guess I'm a mastering whore in that regard. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I asked. Uh, I, I always give it my best shot. I don't know how, what else to say. Yeah, I asked the question uh, to someone who brings out a lot of audio file releases, and I said, "Why, why don't we see uh, Fats Domino?" Mm. They said, "Because the original tapes are terrible." Yeah, um, I I can't recall hearing one, but yeah, um, but there are some like that. So um, I... there's an there's an engineer. I won't mention him by name, but I'll tell you, he did a lot of work for Atlantic, mm. that has always been uh a struggle working on his rock stuff hmm. his early jazz recordings were wonderful wonderful hmm. but once we got into about 1965 ugh. anyway hmm. i kind of don't even want to think about it <laughs> so kevin what you know you, you brought up an interesting point just a moment ago um do when 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 you're done with your 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 title right you're like hey you know i i booked all the engineering hours we're i i have a finished product that i i am confident i can put my name in the dead wax right i'm signing off on it what is like how how many folks in on the on the other end of the 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 fence then really care about what this final product sounds like. I mean, I'm sure that Don Waz, you know, Joe Harley, obviously all the Blue Note stuff, they're like, hey man, this is phenomenal. This is exactly what we wanna hear. But on, on things that you master for, you know, your, your garden variety, you know, rock pop record, whatever, what, uh -huh. what like, do you get input from the, the executives? Let's oh, call I do, that. I do. Uh, really? I yeah, when I do work for Rhino on, on stuff that they're reissuing that they're really concerned about, I have a lot of conversations with Steve Woolard over there, mm -hmm. um, who's, you know, a bit of a fan of my work, and, and we have a great rapport, and, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll go the extra mile to make Steve happy on, on those Rhino reissues. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about stuff like uh, Yes and... Um, uh what else did i do oh rod stewart and yeah there were there were quite a few things or faces it was fa it was a faces box hey, okay nice yeah there was there, there have been several titles that i've done for them uh bang a gong uh, um uh t-rex and ah, you know, some nice. of those, yeah yeah some, some of those things you know um and the same at concord uh i deal with a guy named chris clowther um and he's always very complimentary and uh, gives me a lot of great feedback. And um, so it's, it's nice. So yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the really big label on the East Coast um, are, are a little less uh, nice to deal with. And uh, I don't do that much work for them anymore. But, uh, but yeah, Warner, Warner and uh, Universal keep me pretty darn busy. And, Not just uh, the notes. It would seem it would seem that way, but <laughs> It's the impulse stuff, which is upcoming, is probably. Oh, probably, gosh. Yeah. I love that yeah. stuff, too. I, I think my, one of my, my favorite jazz album of all time is Blues yeah. in the Abstract to Truth. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just, that's, that, that just does it for me. You know, yeah. I finally, love the kind of blue, Danny. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I, well, I, I could lump those together. I mean, Blue Note is kind. Of, I mean, I mean uh, kind of blue is kind of on a different level. It's it's such an iconic record. Yeah, but uh, iconic. Yeah, that's that's a good name for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of like Fleetwood Mac rumors. Pardon me. Kind of like yeah. rumors. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, everybody knows kind of blue. Not everybody knows blues in the abstract truth. Yes. So I try to turn people onto that record who have never heard it. Yeah. When, when, it, when it comes to releases like the upcoming Life at the Lighthouse 12 LP box set, Lee Morgan, <laughs> uh, um, just, just, just for, for, for know it, how, how long, how many hours? do you spend on, on listening to this music, on, 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 on mastering it? It must be an unbelievable amount of work. No, I'll tell you a little secret on that one. Please. That record was uh, remixed by um, Steve Jenowick, who is Al Schmidt's protege. Wow. And Steve put in a lot of work on that. And what he gave me was pretty darn good. Wow. Not quite what I would expect to get from Al Schmidt, but real close. Cool. So it was not nearly as much work as you might think. Okay, very wow. interesting. So, but, but I'm, I'm just being out. painfully honest here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'd love to tell you, hey, it took me 10 months to do that record. <laughs> you know, but it, it comes out in, at, at the end of July, I think. The third, third it's been postponed July. like twice. Pardon? It was It was supposed to have been out in August two years ago for Lee Morgan's birthday whatever that would have oh, really? been yeah I'm so, 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 so your work lies back with some quite some some years yeah, it was quite back. some time ago yeah ah okay okay and you can't talk about it for all those years yeah yeah, yeah i kind of yeah <laughs> but you know wow. I, I love jazz um i love blue note and i love the blue note artists i mean i know that well actually that is being released through blue note and and uh, universal but yeah it was um that was, was fun. And and I was just listening to uh, to the great podcast you you and Joe did a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> I guess Joe was talking about all the upcoming titles for 2022. It yeah. seems like there's there's a, a never ending bucket list of stuff that that's going to be coming out. Well, what's been fun with that project is it's not all traditional Blue Note because mm -hmm. Universal also owns. World Pacific, Pacific Jazz, yeah. and, and a few other smaller labels. And of course, there was UA stuff that wasn't part of Blue Note then. Um, so yeah, there have been some amazing titles that I have just uh, been very excited about. Chet Baker and Art Pepper. You have, yes. have you done it already? Yes. Is it good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I love Chet. I, I loved... Uh, I love the the Chet Baker sings. It's always been, yeah, you know, a, a great highlight. record. All those Pacific Jazz titles, so far at least, are absolute highlights in in, in the yes. Tone Poet series. I think. Very, very under undermined and uh, uh, undervalued, I should say. Uh, yeah, no, catalog. I, think, I, I, I think there's so much more stuff that can be done on that. There's so many amazing artists and and, and releases out. But anyway. I guess in due time. Right. Uh, Harold, uh, not, no, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Gerald Wilson. A good one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, if Easter and Christmas will be on one day and Kevin Gray can wish three artists, he can do a remaster. Which, which three artists would that be? Uh, I think we mentioned them. <laughs> we mentioned Led them Zeppelin, the Beatles, and the Stones. Okay. Yeah, that would be. Of were, course. Were, you, or were you talking about Blue Notes? I, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. No, 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 how no. Far we're off not, base we were getting there. Yeah, Carte Blanche. That's, that's a great. That's a great, great topic now because yeah. uh, um, when it comes to the Rolling Stones, in my case, that leads me to half speed mastery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your take? My, my viewers know my take on half speed mastering, and I'm not fond of it at all. What's Nor am your I. take of, of half speed mastering? Well, I think half speed mastering um, was, was there to fix a problem that doesn't exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but the way half speed mastering got going in the more modern era, you know, they used to cut half speed 45s back in the day because mm -hmm. the cutting electronics didn't have enough power. But, uh, but by the time Stan Ricker was doing all the half speed stuff that had to be done for uh, the, the CD4 quad system, mm -hmm. 
uh, when that came to an end, he was left with a half speed mastering system and nothing to cut half speed. And that's how he talked uh, uh, Brad Miller into doing mobile fidelity and all of that stuff. And um, I'm, I'm not a fan of the sound. Uh, it kind of has a smiley face EQ. Um, you can't fix sibilance problems from analog tape with half speed mastering. The problem mm -hmm. happens in playback, not in cutting. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the, the groove looks exactly the same, whether it's cut half speed or full speed, as far as high frequency sibilance and that sort of thing is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and the bottom end tends to get woolly and under damped, um, you know, because everything's getting shifted down an octave. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's I'm, my main, main. I've never been a big fan of that. That the that the down end, the low end is is not. Yeah, I, not I've never been a fan of that, and never been a fan of DMM um, mm -hmm. for different reasons. But yeah, you know, it it seems like that you know the 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 day and age we live in is full of marketing buzzwords, right? And they <laughs> they kind of get marketed obviously as such, and then they become stamps of approval. Right. It's like, right. oh, half speed master. Oh my God, that must sound better. Right. Or DMM, you know, when when the 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 that um the lacquer plant burned down, right? Everybody was kind of like, oh, we're gonna have a lot more DMM stuff coming yeah, out right. now. Um, and, and I always, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, no, dude, relax. Okay, it's not what you think it is. And you know, chances are, you know, I'll prefer, I'll take 140 gram mastered uh by kevin gray record any day of the week over some crazy 180 gram half speed master dmm you know whatever just because it has all those buzzwords in it right right uh yeah yeah and in both cases i've done shootouts with them and i've never lost one so hmm. you know <laughs> um but you know you, uh no never mind can't can't really go there. I was going to mention <laughs> yeah. a new. I, I was going to mention a new trend, but that could bite me in the butt. So I'll, I'll show. <laughs> uh, but but let's stay a second, if you allow us uh, for the another buzzword in a way shootout. Let let's compare and and maybe we stay for the beginning with with Blue Knot, and nobody else can do that probably better than you. Shootout, original, master tape. Uh, all your file remaster, right? How would, you, how would you compare those three, the original, the master tape, and and in most that's a great cases? question, and I'm happy to answer that. Uh, I think Joe Harley and I have both been pretty honest that we're not trying to capture the sound of RVG's mastering. Mm -hmm. We're trying to catch this capture the sound of RVG's original recording. Mm. Because okay. when we compare the master tape to an RVG, they're very different. It's kind of an apple and orange. Wow. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with limitations in the day when, when they were putting those records out. Uh, you know, there was the, the, the issue, again, as we had talked about before, skipping and making it sound loud and jump off the turntable, that kind of thing. And, you know, RVG tended to pan the sides in a bit. He tended to accentuate, accentuate the mid-range. He had to roll, accentuated the upper bass and rolled off the low bass, all to make it play on inexpensive players in the day. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that limitation today. And I think we're giving people something much, much closer to what's on the master tape than, <laughs> than what uh, Rudy did. And, you know, frankly, I think I, I've, I've heard through the grapevine that Rudy was not happy with, he didn't mention us specifically that I'm aware of, but he wasn't happy with any of the reissues of his work that he didn't master. And I don't think that's a not invented here syndrome. I think it's just that he had a different perspective mm -hmm. and uh, he's entitled to it. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, and I he was one of the first persons who jumped on the digital. Wagon. I think Rudy Van Gelder was one of the first to say, oh, let's go digital. Let's, let's oh, absolutely. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. He felt mm -hmm. that it removed all the limitations. I mean, there are limitations to analog. There's no question about it. But mm -hmm. um, it's a sound that uh, a lot of us absolutely love, me being one of them. Um, so, yeah. What, what, what are the limitations when it comes to analog? Well, um, there's a little higher, we're talking about analog tape or, or the phonograph record 
or both. No, what you, yeah, what you I mean, they have to, to be, say, uh, they have to be kind of looked at differently. I mean, there's limitations in the analog tape in terms of the lowest octave of bass. Uh, there's limitations, you know, compared to, let's say, the microphone feed coming in and what you're hearing off of tape. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, uh, distortion goes up a bit. There's more third harmonic distortion, considerably more third harmonic distortion on analog tape than there would be on a digital. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, even be, that being said, uh, you put a lot of people down in the room and you let them hear the feed and the digital output and the analog output, a lot of people are going to pick the analog tape. It just... Mm -hmm. it, it's it has a thing it has its own thing and it's great i love it it's probably the way to go <laughs> yeah. and, 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 oh, and and just one other point and and then the phonograph record you know you have the issues of particularly not so much in jazz but in in pop you know you got vocal sibilance mm -hmm. um and you've got bass excursions that can cause skipping so sometimes there's some limitations that had to be, have to be imposed there to get it to play back properly on on less than audiophile grade systems, but um, you know, it's... Peter Gabriel comes to mind. You know, he was like one of the the early proponents of digital as well. For you know all the the reasons you just mentioned, I, I remember reading about. You know, he was like, you know, hey, I I, I really you know I, I want to record stuff the way that I hear it, and you know, I guess it, it's it's uh, you know who knows just how much these guys really can hear these days anymore anyway. Right. I mean, I, I cringe <laughs> when I see, you know, Jimmy page overseen reissue of the Led uh -huh. Zeppelin catalog. Right. And I'm thinking of like, Oh my God, you know, I mean, who knows, you know, I don't even want to know what, what his, uh, his internal sound quality is like. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak to that at all, but I know what you're saying. Um, what was I going to mention? Um, what did you say at the very beginning? I was going to comment on something. Peter Gabriel. Oh, yeah. Well, well, just that. It's funny. He embraced digital before digital was really very good. Mm, yeah. And so did Rudy. Right. You know, I, I don't think digital really even got decent until about 92. Um, the first thing that hit the market that was an eye opener, ear opener for me was the Wadia A to D converter. Because really? Because it all been going... Oh yeah, we'd all been going through the the 1630 processors, and then yeah. and then there were the Apogee converters, and none of that stuff sounded very good. It just didn't. And then when the Wadia came along, it was like, whoa! So this is what digital's supposed to sound like. Okay. Um, and that was still 16 bit, you know, 44 one, and it only got better from there. You know, I have a Pacific Microsonics, which I just love the sound of. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not the be all end all in ultimate definition but it never airs on the side of harsh or ugly. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of my favorite go-to converter, both for A to D and D to A. But. So now we are, we are going in a way, we, we have been gone back from digital, now we are all analog in a way, in a way. Yeah. Uh, do you have an opinion or maybe you know things we don't know? What's, what's the next thing? Will we stay analog for the next two decades? What, what do you think where the journey will take us? Good question. Or, or maybe two, two parallels, the analog way and, and, and the streaming way. What, what well, I'm already, I'm already seeing that, although it's funny, there's very little meeting in the middle. It's one or the other, you know, because I'm doing high res uh, files for download on virtually every new title that I do. Um, e either DSD or 2496 or 24192. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a capture of it with my EQ and, and, and the way it's done for vinyl so that they'll match. And uh, so a lot of people get those downloads. They don't buy the vinyl. A lot of people love the vinyl and never heard a download. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, I have not heard the download. I've just heard the files that I've created to make the downloads from. I haven't bothered to go download them to see what's happening you know, in their uh, process. Mm -hmm. But uh, do, do yeah, you so, see so. like the, the modern day artist or I shouldn't say modern day, let's just say like contemporary artist, you know, whatever genre it may be. Do, do you get the sense that they're like, hey, Kevin, I, I really want the, the vinyl to sound great as opposed to the digital? Or is it kind of like, are they ambivalent about it? Like, hey, you know what? It, it's going to sound great no matter what, because Kevin was involved in it. Um, don't know really know how to answer that question. 
Uh, Maybe it's a silly question. It depends on the client. Yeah, no, I mean, you can kind of tell in a five minute conversation with these guys, which ones um, just want to get uh, the Kevin Gray buzz and which guys really, really love vinyl, you know? Interesting. (laughs) Those are the ones I really like to work with. So there's Um, a definite that there's a definite, I guess, I guess to, to paraphrase the question, there are definitely artists around that you work with that have a, a great affinity for vinyl. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Well, one who, who I, I'm going to tout because he's coming back online again. He disappeared for a couple of uh, years is a uh, Sean Bettner uh, with, uh, with uh, what's his company. You probably know. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, uh, intervention record. Intervention. intervention thank yeah, you. Intervention yeah. Intervention records. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, he's going to be doing some new stuff. He's, he's yeah. getting ready to, to do some more licensing. That's awesome. And Sean is a, the nicest guy in the world to deal with. And number two, one of the most caring focused guys, yeah. you know, we yeah. always have a good quality pressing to yeah. compare it to. And then we kind of make our decisions on what to do with it from, from the. Yeah. Danny, Danny and me, we had the huge pleasure to do uh, also a video with, with Shane Buttner and, and what's so striking when it comes to intervention, it's not your, let's call it typical audio file stuff. He really goes yeah. uh, Murray Head, yes. for example, or, yes. or Joan no, Armas, and that's also very cool that we have those titles yeah. uh, uh, as, as such great releases. Right. Audio file right. Really, really must, I think, mm, and some of them mm-hmm. are not what I would call greatest sounding audio file recordings, mm-hmm. but it's really nice to give them the best treatment they can possibly get as an audio file release the church and, um you know hmm? the church Which the, the 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 group that the the record that's coming out i guess it's been forever delayed with all the stuff going on but um starfish that's coming out uh, i think it's shipping in in uh, july if i'm not mistaken this is for shane yeah that was probably done at sterling I don't think oh, okay. I did that title. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Which is fine. You know, because if the tapes are on the East all. Coast, <laughs> if the tapes yeah. are on the East Coast, he, he goes to, to Ryan Smith. And Ryan does a great job. You know, yeah. I, I can't I can't fault Ryan. So yeah. Yeah, we need I I think we really need more of, of for example, what you've done to rumors or what 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 Shane Butner uh, uh, does for, for 80s and 90s uh, yeah. rock. This this comes too short. And in a way, when 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 we go back to the beginning and, and see what classic records had put out with the who uh, um, mm. uh, peter gabriel led zeppelin etc etc mm-hmm. this title is coming a bit short nowadays and and mm. we always have those uh, audiophile remaster or half speed masters from abbey road uh, for example bob marley and all the, the the rolling stones and this is mm. in a way and i can say that i'm a private person here yeah, a waste it's just a waste mm. because it's not the standard that we are used from, from example, you, Kevin Gray or Ryan, uh, Ryan K. Smith. And that, that's a pretty shame because those are extremely report, uh, uh, important uh, recording. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right. one artist that comes to mind in that light, um, uh, Michael, is, is Prince, right? Exactly. I think the, the, yeah. the Prince catalog, uh, man, Kevin, if you would get your hands on that, I did. I've done almost the entire catalog. On Prince? Right, right after Prince died. You're kidding. Yeah. No. Where is it? I don't know. I'm sure it came out. But I don't think they were, it wasn't a box set. They didn't make a big splash about it. They Interesting. just were making sure all the stuff was back in the catalog again. Interesting. I know that. Yeah. Uh, and as a, and Aretha today, Franklin. I did, I did a whole bunch of Aretha Franklin, too. Right after where the are Prince. they? I want them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they put out a they Can put I out one of great, from you. They put out a box set of the singles, which was really fun. All the mono. Arena really? Singles. Oh, I yeah, gotta get yeah. that. Uh, I would I would send off an email to Steve Willard and say, <laughs> "Yeah, dude, yeah. where's this stuff?" And, <laughs> and I don't know if you heard any of it, but you know, I've remastered almost the entire Kinks catalog. Yes. Which which was for BMG. Yes. So that and that was fantastic. I I heard it. Uh, a friend of mine got the, the the I think it was a box set. Um, yes. And it's it's well, actually exactly. there were three. There was an al- album box set, an EP box set, and a and a, a forty five single box set. Wow. So they, yeah, I, I missed now, that. That book. that stuff was not audiophile in my book. I mean, you know, those just were not 
uh, what shall we say? They weren't up to the Beatles standards recording wise, right. but uh, for what they are, uh, I was very happy with the way it came out. And I'm a huge fan of the music. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can't beat it. Anything British yeah. invasion. I was, I was. Yes. Big on. Yeah. I think that one of the most important things to consider, that, of, of course, we love our audiophile stuff. Of course, for me, some also enough when I know this is as, as good as it gets. That's tough. If I know this is the most, the most you can get out of the tapes. Yeah. I get it. That's what I want. I, I don't want more, but I, in a way, I don't want less. Yes. There, there is there is a lot of room for for other releases. Let's hope that they all will come out in 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 in, in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but right. but what I also often said on my channel when I speak a lot about uh, audio file reissues that comes out, man, the day of Kevin Gray has at least 28 hours <laughs> all right <laughs> because you it, read it sure felt stuff. like it year before last and this year last year was a little dead but uh now it's it's i hit the ground running in january and it's been a crazy year this year and and 2019 was also a crazy crazy year so and, and i can only imagine you you your schedule gets booked out months and quarters ahead of time i mean i i it does on some stuff yes um my my the bane of my existence is that so many of the labels now are going to europe because uh they can't get impressed in time here anywhere wow not not just wow. rti and qrp they can't get into got a groove they can't get into in, you know third man whatever so uh i have to keep mondays and tuesdays open for anything that's getting shipped to europe wow. and then at least wednesday and thursday for domestic because i don't cut on friday because i don't want stuff to sit over the weekend yeah so that's wow. my contribution to this crazy industry but wow. <laughs> uh, so it makes it can make my life a little crazy yeah if if danny and me we decide now we are doing an audio file remaster danny here are my tapes and then let's call kevin <laughs> and and when when would you have the time? Is so, okay? No, I do it in April twenty three or, or what? what <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm I'm not running those kind of lead times at all. The pressing okay. plants are. Uh, as a matter of fact, well, well, let me just tell you. I I try to turn around stuff within about three weeks. That, really? That's a, wow. Yeah, that's about my lead time. Uh, I tell people, see, I don't. If I've got a big, high profile project for a known client. Yes, I'll put it on my calendar, but I generally don't start figuring out what I'm mastering until everything is in the queue. You know, they've got their files or their tapes or whatever they're using to me. Then I schedule it because I, I can figure out what has to fit in Monday, Tuesday, what has to fit in Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it <coughs> makes for a little more sanity. <laughs> um, but I wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier um, about lead times and so forth. And I think that is my biggest concern. Uh, it's taking eight months to a year for a new client or an existing client on a smaller run to get a record pressed at most of the plants in the U.S. And I don't know how they deal with that. I, I actually wow. had I had ongoing conversations. I had files sent to me and I was getting ready to master a project. And all of a sudden, the guy called me in a panic and he said, look, I'm canceling the project. I said, why? What happened? I, said, I can't get it pressed within a year anywhere. Wow. Uh, he's a he's a new label. Um, it's a new artist. Uh, it's a great recording. I was like, I was I was kind of devastated because I I had already put some work into it, which I haven't charged him for. Hopefully, wow. he'll get it resolved. You know, but it's a major concern. It's like, what yeah. what is going to happen to the industry if people can't get their records pressed? Yeah. Um, wow. And the other thing is, you know, you you touched on the lacquer thing. You know, when when the Apollo plant burned. I was very blessed that I had been using MDC lacquers from Japan for two years wow. before that fire, um, because I started to get unhappy with Apollo's back around 2017. So I switched over almost entirely to MDCs and I've been able, you know, I've kind of been grandfathered in there and I've been able to get lacquers, but you know, that shut down capitals mastering. They couldn't get lacquers yep. period. And so that was the first concern. Now it's the lead times at the pressing plants. It's wow. like everybody's trying to increase capacity, but you know, there's only there's only so many record presses, and I guess GZ is making new ones, but um, I don't know. It's truly That's unprecedented times. Yeah. 
and try to get Stoughton car, uh, jackets. It's not easy. Yeah. Oh, same thing. Same problem. Yeah. I met Jack Stoughton for the first time at the Making Vinyl Conference in 2019. What a sweetheart of a guy. And his wife. They're, they're yeah. both they're amazing folks. And I was very impressed. Yeah, that was one uh, one of the reasons I asked you the question. Uh, let's compare 2010 and 2021. If someone has told you, let's say in 2012, that uh, there will be uh, 25,000 pieces release, audio file release for $100 of Kind of Blue, you would have been at least surprised, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes. That's, that's quite yes. a development. Yeah. It's, I mean, how many reissues have there been of that record? I'm uh, guessing about seven. At least. Yeah. More, maybe? Holy cow. I mean, yeah. it's a great record. I love it. I play it all the time. But, you know, I don't think the world needs another reissue of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we haven't even done the 45 RPM yet. <laughs> exactly. The, the new one. There was yeah. the classic one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. And that, that was so funny. I had the big, big honor and pleasure to be on the panel with, uh, uh, for example, uh, Michael Hobson from Classic Records and Bernie Grantman, Chad Kassim. And uh, when Bernie Grantman uh, uh, told that he had the kind of blue tape and he took, put out a knife and, and want to, and said, that's what we do with tapes. I'm not afraid to, to take my scalpel. And, and do you do that too nowadays or isn't that something you do Very, nowadays? very occasionally. Um, uh, okay. without mentioning any names about the person or the project. <laughs> um, I cut a, a reissue about a year ago, I guess it was. And they got the test pressings and said, hey, there's a pop right where the vocal comes in on, on this track, which is an iconic track. You've heard it a million times. Mm -hmm. And I went and I listened to the tape and I said, it's on the tape. Well, it's not on any of the digital releases. And I said, of course not. They edited it out digitally. Well, then I guess we're going to have to cut that, recut that record from the digital file. And I said, uh, I can remove that with a razor blade. <laughs> and when you can, and it won't hurt the tape. And I said, no, you know what it was? It was a vocal punch in. It's where they punched in the recorder to okay. start recording the vocal. I mean, it, okay. you know, anybody who's worked in the studio mm -hmm. any amount of time would recognize that immediately. It's been on every analog release ever since 1960. <laughs> five i guess right you know so it just it kind of and then i'm doing another release again i can't mention it <laughs> but uh same same guy in charge uh same level of iconic record that everybody knows and here at the end of the fade there's this tick and i'm going mm. if i don't pull this out i know i'm going to hear about it i'm just going to be recutting it so I might as well just do it now and get it out of there. And so I did. <laughs> again, it's been on every analog release of that record since day one. Wow. So yeah, which, 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 leads, which leads us in a way to the warble gate when it comes to the blue note. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been a lot, you know, maybe to see my, to, to talk a bit about my side, my view, if I get a record which plays around 40 minutes and there is a fraction of a second which is not that perfect, I won't have a big problem with it. Mm. But, but there are other parts of the community and, and this fraction of a second is suddenly so important. <laughs> what is your of view when it comes to this? Well, I can tell you what most of, those, most of those are caused by splices in the original recording, mm. um, not mm. to fix a broken tape, but maybe to put in another section from another take when the regular was done originally. And those splices start to come apart. They ooze slightly and they stick as they go through the machine. Mm -hmm. Now okay. you could go through and replace every single one of them. I've had to do that occasionally. Sometimes it's been done before I get the tape, but uh, mm. generally, you know, like you say, if it goes by really fast, I let it go because I know it's been on other issues of the record. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say yeah. about it. Yeah, I get you. I get your point. Huh? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's sometimes uh, um, st quite striking how, how much room this kind of discussions on, on certain places uh, uh, takes. And uh, that's, for me, then I'm out because, as I said, the fraction of a second tomorrow. 
yeah. What, 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 what can well, you yeah, I, I have to be careful what I say, but a lot of those guys on those forums need to get a life. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, it's the forum experts. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of my favorite things that happens is when somebody will say, hey, I heard such and such there. And it's like, oh, yeah, I heard it too. I heard it too. I heard it too. I heard it too. You know, it's like, so there are only 27 posts after it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which they probably, none of those guys would have noticed it if the first guy hadn't pointed, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kevin Gray, if you if you consider the work you have done so far, which, as we stated, 2,347, are there, let's say, one, two, or three releases which stick out to you, which are incredible, important, or, or where your heart is in a way? For, for what oh, yeah. Have... Oh, yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the most iconic albums that I got to work on, and I did it with Doug Sachs, was Dark Side of the Moon for the 30th anniversary. And what was that, uh, 2003? Yep. That the... Yep. The, the, 2003. The... Yep. Yeah. yeah. That was a thrill. Mm. Um, love that record. I've listened to it a million times. And the first time we threaded up the tape and hit play and heard the heartbeats, I mean, the chills that went down my spine, uh, I can't describe. I can't describe. Um, and so that was that was a blast. Um, and working with Doug on it was fun too. Doug's, Doug was such a curmudgeon. <laughs> but uh, we worked well on that project. Uh, that was one. Uh, oh, getting to do the the uh, 50th anniversary reissue of uh, of uh, kind of blue a year late because the first one got got panned badly by the press. Mm. Now that's that's a pet peeve of mine. They had me specially remaster that. I put my all into it. I was very happy with the way it came out and stand behind it. It never got stickered, and I get I get emails to this day from people saying how can I find out which pressing before I buy it is the one that you did? And I said, I don't think you can. Wow. <laughs> I happen to have one because they sent it to me right after it came out, you know, yeah. but wow. It doesn't happen very often. I had to request it and probably re-request it and re-re-request it. And they finally sent me one. Mm. So, uh, so those are two, I don't know. Um, it's very funny. I'm, not only am I remastering things two and three times, I'm now remastering things that I mastered originally. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I don't know if I should mention it. I will. Um, it's. I don't think it's out yet. I'm pretty sure it's coming out in the um, in the classics series for Blue Note. I did um, uh, Places and Spaces by Donald Byrd, um, which I mastered originally in 1975 or whenever it was. Wow. And and also Bobby Humphrey, um, uh, what's the title of that one? About, it was around the same time that it was wow. released. So I did both of those albums with the Sky High Production guys who were a, a bunch of my favorite clients ever. Um, and so I got to reissue those. I, another one that was really funny that came in the other day. Okay, when I first got into mastering, my mentor was Bob McLeod, Artisan Sound Recorders. I met him in my first year of high school. He invited me down to the studio. The first minute I walked in the door and watched what he was starting to do, I knew that was what I wanted to do for a living. Total halcyon okay. moment for me. Okay. The first time he invited me to come down, again, I'm in high school, the time he invited me to come down and actually sit in on a session, it was Ry Cooter's first album, uh, just called Ry Cooter, the one with the Airstream trailer on the front of the, if you know the album. Um, and uh, Doug Botnick was, was the mix engineer on it. And so I got to sit in on the whole thing. I just reissued that album or did a reissue of it for uh, Speaker's Corner just like two weeks ago. And it was just mm -hmm. such a trip to hear this record again that I own and that I had been able to sit in on before I was even a mastering engineer. You know, I was in my first <laughs> year of high school. So weird things. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah. What's what's um, like if, if you look at something like that, that you've mastered in the 70s, and you're looking at it, you know, all these decades later, what are like the two, three biggest improvements that, that you're capable of delivering today vis-a-vis -vis back then? Well, my chain is much, much better than what I was cutting on back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I can hype the whole thing. You know, I've, I've built a custom system. All the analog gear was built from scratch. The tape machine electronics, the tape heads are custom. The uh, uh, everything in the console, the line amplifiers, the equalizers, the limiters are all class A discrete solid state. Um, and my disc cutting system is all class A discrete solid state, including, you know, wow. 300 watt per channel class A amplifiers. I yeah. didn't have that kind of stuff back then. So mm -hmm. I already have a, a little bit of a leg up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the tape's going to sound a little bit better being played back on my machine than it would have on, on a stock studer back in the day. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that accounts for a bit. And then, you know, I'm listening on better speakers. You know, mm -hmm. most of the stuff I was doing in the seventies, I was listening on Westlake monitors mm -hmm. um, you know, so cables uh, are probably your question? better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, the whole chain has basically been upgraded considerably. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And and I guess the underlying, e even as the underlying technologies may not have changed much, it's all the ancillary stuff that that really has amplified. I guess the 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 resolution factor. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we put AudioQuest wiring in the whole system back in 2008, I think that was. Okay. Uh, and then upgraded that wiring when I opened the new room in 2010, 11, you know, right in that transition there. Wow. So, you know, there's been, a, there's been a lot of things like that. So, so when it, your equipment has grown and grown and grown, of course, I get that. But when it comes to the masters, is, can, is, it, is it legit to say, at this late 50s, mid 60s, and 60s, Martha uh, records the, 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 the uh, recording technology has been, in a way, the golden age. And, and uh, quality wise, are a higher standard than, let's say, the late 70s, early 80s, early 90s? Or, oh, or no question. I, I agree with that 100%. I, I even wrote a paper mm -hmm. about it, talking about um, how, how sound it did a lot of degradation from about 1963 on, you know, every, we went into the whole early solid state era, which was followed by the early integrated circuit era, which was even worse, in my opinion. Um, things, you know, I think things improved going from four track to eight track to 16 track, because there wasn't all this bouncing and combining of tracks that had to be done mm -hmm. when they got up to 16 track. Then we go to 24 track and it takes another downturn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because the track width is narrower, uh, there's there's more hiss. So that almost, you know, means that you have to have noise reduction. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had Dolby A originally, then Dolby uh, SR. Um, and so there's all this extra electronics that you're going through. And then on the mix side, you know, you don't have, you know, it's hard to get 24 hands on a console. So, uh, or more. And so uh, then we have VCA automation. And it was like, it just went down hill in chunks mm -hmm. it was just unbelievable yeah. and i was there watching it as it happened going what's happening to the sound here wow. and uh, i started investigating that and that was what i came up with so yeah you you made a very good point there so yeah an all tube recording from 1958 through 1963 is pretty hard to beat sonically mm -hmm. the weakest link in the chain was the scotch 111 tape mm -hmm. okay you know okay. I think even even the microphones were has tubes in it, right? In oh, absolutely. Way. And mm -hmm. you know, I ha I own fourteen vacuum tube microphones, Neumanns, AKGs, and um, you can't beat the sound. Yeah. You cannot beat the sound. Uh, the the solid state counterparts to not every one of those mics, but most of those mics, it was a step down. Also, it really was. Um, you know, I I, I think. Um, uh, what, what's his name? Russ Ham wrote an, a paper in the AES about um, uh, tubes versus transistors that came out around 72. And the point that he made that was really interesting is in the critical early stages with the microphone being the earliest, um, if you've got electronics in there, um, tubes handle overloads so much better than, than transistors do. Wow. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. And then the yeah. next stage would be the mic pre- and the next stage after that is whatever compressor you're going through if you're compressing. And uh, so it, it, it really helped to have tubes in those stages. Yeah, the headroom. Made, uh, uh, made a huge difference. Yeah. Well, Thank you for asking talk. that question. That's one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Oh. 
<laughs> okay, now I'm very proud. No, uh, uh, yeah, but but uh, you know, I, I have a good friend here in Germany. It's Volker Bohlmeier from Einstein Audio, and we exactly talked about because all his stuff is also always with tubes and and. He explained a lot to me with the with the headroom, and I think that has something to do with what what we explained right now. Oh, the voltage swing differences are huge. Mm. Yeah, but, yeah. That's... And even even when a tube goes into distortion, it's much less noticeable. It's not putting out a square wave mm -hmm. like a solid state device when when you overdrive it. So yeah, it's it's a huge difference. Um, I I won't get really big into this, but I just mention it offhand. I have been working for 15 years since 2005 to build an all vacuum tube recording system from microphones mm -hmm. all the way through to the cutter head. Wow. Um, I, well, to analog tape, if I'm going to tape or and to transfer to the cutter or to do direct to disc to the cutter. Um, it's been a huge project and it's all coming to fruition now. Wow. So I'm really yeah, excited about great. it. So you're going to be able to do the whole chain A to Z all in tubes. All tubes, not, wow. not a single transistor in the path. Wow. So, I, love to hear, yeah. I love to hear that. So, no, I, I, I think it's going to be fun. The only company I know in the world that's doing this is electrical recording in, uh, uh, you know, in their mastering yeah. system yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. in England. And then also there's that label in, well, you probably know, Michael, it's, it's in Europe, could be in Germany. They're doing uh, everything all tube to tape. Oh. I think they... I think they go to electrical to do the actual cutting. I think I just got a record from them. Um, yeah, I know who you're Didn't talking tell about. Tell me about it then. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's they're they're in Germany. Um, the, yeah. Oh gosh, what is it? Uh, I thought I had it here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and they're quite really expensive. They're, they're selling for like a hundred bucks on those too. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's it's definitely something you can hear. I mean, as far as transparency and all that, uh, with with the level of of playback quality we have these days, right? You, know, you can easily hear the difference um, on on you know going from a solid state to an all tube uh, cutting system and all that. So brilliant! Mm -hmm. I, I'm super yeah, my, excited my all, for you. My all tube yeah, system so cool is, know, is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm I'm very proud of it. Um, I, I'm using Macintosh uh, MI350s, highly modified, um, to, to actually uh, drive the cutter head. And wow. what an amazing job they do. I mean, it's just headroom for days. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> is, this, is this something that, you know, at some point is going to get, I guess, marketed? Um, or, yeah, or I, I, I'm basically starting a label. And it's wow. for my it's for myself. I'm not making this available to clients unless they want to come in and record the album and do the whole thing all the way through. Wow! Because uh, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to compete my, with myself. You know, <laughs> yeah, just no. It really it was just an idea. You know, you, you you've mentioned what I firmly believe in the golden age, mm -hmm. which I would call you know 50. Well, you go go back to 55, 56 through about 64. You know, I'm trying yeah. to kind of capture that essence. That's and, awesome. Um, wow. That's great. Yeah. Uh, that's so cool. There but is a future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so you guys, you guys get the, the, the release, you know, the, the, the press release on this, because I really haven't talked about it to anybody. So. That's incredible. Wow. You drew it out of me. You drew it out of me. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. That's exciting, man. That's awesome. I love it. Totally exciting. Totally. What I always ask myself, because you are one of the few persons who, who can answer that. How far we have, if you have a really decent hi-fi system and, and, and a beautiful uh, Kevin Gray remaster from Sidewind on SRX, how far are we away from the original master tape? Are we very close or is there still some difference? Um, there will always be some difference. I mean, <laughs> when you consider how many amplifiers that you're going through, going from a tape to the cutter head, um, it's a lot. It's amazing that it sounds as transparent as, as I feel that it does. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a very, very slight degradation. If everything is done right, mm -hmm. um, you have to actually quantify it by saying on the outside of a 12-inch LP, you know, it, 
the top end rolls down, distortion goes up as you get to the center of a record. It's mm -hmm. inherent. There's no way to go get around that really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's limitations in that regard, but boy, when, when, when you drop the needle on the outside of the groove and you play it against the master tape, uh, it, it's amazing how close they sound. It yeah. really Good. is. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. And, and, and another thing, because this is always a topic throughout the last year in a way, you know, I've, I've shown the three sidewinders, for example. And <laughs> when I listen to those three sidewinders, they all sound different. It's, and that's a strange thing in a way because mastered by Kevin Gray. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, but, no, but, but I think that it shows that every detail counts. Matters. Yep. I can, I can give you a little accounting of why those differences. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, the 45 version, because um, did I do that for chat or did I do that for Music Matters? Music Matters, right? The one I've, uh, I have the uh, chat, the, the analog production, and I have the Music Matters SRX on the quiet vinyl. Oh, the 33. Mm -hmm, okay. Exactly. Well, when, when we were doing all those 45s, um, that was with a different tape machine, and I had not upgraded my console yet. That all happened yeah. in 2013, and my system improved seriously at that mm -hmm. point. It really did. Um, and... Uh, so that accounts for a difference. Also, the pressing plant makes a difference. Um, the stuff that goes to Europe, I don't know. I might be biting the hand that feeds me on saying this, but there's a difference in the sound of a record pressed on a 2LX Alpha and a record pressed on an SMT. Yeah. Um, Interesting. And I got into doing these sound tests as far back as the 80s wow. when, when Doug Sachs was using RTI for his pressing, but he was having the plating done at KM in Burbank who had Tulex Alpha presses. He couldn't get a pressing he was happy with out of there in terms of having the top end and, and, and the detail. It just, it wasn't happening. And he could get it at RTI. So he went plating there and then had the metal parts sent to RTI. This has always been a pressing, a problem with a lot of the pressings out of Europe. Um, you know, like, <laughs> I wish you could hear Dark Side of the Moon pressing that RTI pressed just mm -hmm. as a test pressing for a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded better than the one that came out of Europe and the same thing with rumors. Wow. So, yeah, uh, that was know, my, I, yeah, that was my approach too, because, you know, there's always this discussion that, of course, there is not, KB, okay, this is a classic, uh, uh, I, I, Come on, let's do it quick. I, I, of course not. Mm. But in the process, after your mastering, things go, let's say, differently. Right. And, and even when you say that you improved your system, and I compared those, this album really sincere and, mm. and put a lot of time in it. And the analog production and the SRX sounds better. I'm careful now better than the classic release uh -huh. in my in my opinion it's always an opinion oh the, the classic one the classic is well that was bernie that was bernie grumman that was a totally different system okay you know okay. that i can understand um and no no no, no. i'm talking about excuse me I, oh yeah the classic about, series yeah that was preston series. okay i'm sorry yeah that was preston in europe Number so, yeah. one, SRX, uh, SRX, number one, number two, 45, analog production. Right, right, right. I'm just talking about my opinion. Number three, classic series. Mm. So yeah. you like the SRX best or the uh, the 45? The SRX? Yeah, the SRX I would agree with you. I would agree with you. I would, I, I would agree. The details. And I would really put them in the same the ranking. Yeah. I'd put them in the same ranking as you do. So, so I guess that, that opens up the conversation to, you know, these, these new vinyl formulas that are coming out. Mm -hmm. um i guess they do make quite a bit of a difference they do they do mm -hmm. um but you know we're, we're kind of entering another renaissance here on records mm -hmm. if <laughs> if they could just keep the capacity to the point that the rent industry stays healthy uh, i think we'll all be you know very good in five years yeah um yeah. because yeah uh both chad and and rti um have done a lot of work on that and i think it's paying off yeah absolutely yeah. Amazing. You know, I have my own explanation why. 
because in my in my world in my explanation that if you have noise if you have noise you you lose room for detail in of a course. way you know, noise covers detail yeah and and these new formulas have less noise, noise. yeah so more detail right fascinating i mean who would have thought that in 2021 we're gonna have we're gonna be talking about new vinyl formulas <laughs> <laughs> well you yeah. know it, it, it yeah. it's a really really funny thing to me when i look back you know i got in the industry in 72 wow and and you know vinyl reigned supreme you know even the cassette wasn't really touching vinyl at that point in mm -hmm. time and so i figured well you know i'll retire re retire cutting records by 1986, I wasn't even doing vinyl anymore. Everything had gone CD. And I thought, well, okay, I'll retire doing CDs. Like, nope, I'll probably retire doing vinyl. I mean, you know, I was kind of in on the vinyl resurgence from the standpoint that, you know, DCC jumped back in in 92. Mm -hmm. I did the heavy vinyl series for MCA in 95, which was the first major label to jump back in. Yep. Um, did all of that stuff with Tom Berry and Warner in 2005. And so I've watched the exponential takeoff of, and never could have predicted it in a million years when wow. hoffman came to me and said hey you know marshall wants to start putting out vinyl again in 92 i'm like what is he out of his mind i mean <laughs> i just figured it was a dead issue wow you know wow. i was as happy as a clam that he did it but my initial reaction was why <laughs> i mean but, but sound, you, sound notwithstanding but you know and, and look at what happened of, Excuse me. No, go go ahead, Danny. I can do that. I, I, and look at what, what what's happening on on some of the DCC titles uh, that are on eBay. I mean, astronomical prices. It's unbelievable. I unbelievable. I know. I know. And so often it's for test pressings. Yeah. You know, I don't think people get the concept that a test pressing is to approve, and there could be problems with it that were causing it to be rejected. Right. You know, it's it's like when I see these test pressings going for three and four and five hundred dollars, I'm like. Oh boy, I sure hope it's a good one. <laughs> Speaking of, I have, it's funny you should mention that, Kevin. I, I don't know if you'll remember, but when we did the first round of test pressings for Meeting by the River, yes, uh, somebody's cell phone went off and you could hear in the pressing the noise from the tower and the phone uh -huh. buzzing. Yeah, I know that sound, yeah. And you had to recut it. And so there you go. I mean, the, I, I cherish it just because oh, it's, you know, historic. You I know guess. what? You know what? I only had that problem one time and it was with that C37 with the one inch head stack. No, there was something, I think it was happening right at the playback head between the head and the input electronics. There was something that wasn't shielded that way. Yes, yeah. I had for, totally forgotten that. I've never had that problem again, ever. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I have it, and, and you know, I play it, and sure enough, there's the buzzer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you know, I got to tell you a very quick, funny story about that. Um, you were there, so you can you were a witness to it. I did that thing where I actually created an audio CD, and we ran that for preview. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. And I had yep. to delay it manually. You know, well, apparently, uh, Chad told Barry Wolfson at at sterling that that's what we had done and he goes that's not possible and i said to chad oh, okay then we won't do it <laughs> well you said you already did it and i said well barry says it can't be done so i guess it can't be done <laughs> yeah that's amazing yeah i i remember that that was that was insane insane yeah i you know i'm very proud of that record too i love that album i love that album yeah that was, that was amazing but, yeah but let me get back to my question uh, um, okay have you been one of, of, of the persons like, for example, Michael Fremer, when, when the CD came up, he said, oh, we are in trouble now. Uh, and, and because he thought that vinyl is much more uh, better than, than the CD. Have you been one of those persons too and said, hey, why, why are we going for the CD? Vinyl is better? Or have you just gone with the flow and said, okay, I, I have to adapt and do a CD? Well, that's also a very good question. I, um, by the way, Danny, some of your questions have been good too. I just, I've been really impressed with Michael. <laughs> <so sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking count no, here. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Michael. Uh, I, <laughs> when I first heard the CD, I was like, hey, 
this is great. No ticks, no pops, no noise. You know, yeah, like everybody, you know, yeah, yeah, this is great. Until so convenient. I start, yeah, well, yeah, but, but even sonically, it was nice to have no ticks, no pops, no noise. But the very first time I started comparing the vinyl release of an album to the CD release, I went, huh? I, I remember two of the first two titles that I did the comparison on was Michael Jackson's Thriller. Mm -hmm. and the other was um earth winds and earth wind and fires album rise wow one of them had been done by bernie one had yep. been done by doug sex i put up the cd and the vinyl and the vinyl blew the cd away on both of them mm -hmm. yeah and it was mm -hmm. pretty much the same things i was hearing mm -hmm. didn't have the detail on the top end didn't have the punch on the bottom now mm -hmm. i don't understand that that shouldn't have been an issue i don't mm -hmm. think um, maybe it was part of the vinyl artifact that everybody loves. I don't know, but you know, there was no comparison. Hmm. And like I said, until the Pacific or the, uh, not the Pacific, sorry, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Apoge uh, the, um, Wadia. Wadia, until the Wadia converter came out in 92, I don't think digital was even close. There, there was, it was total apples and oranges with vinyl. Wow. Um, wow. and, and, you know, today we've got 24, 192 with good converters. Uh, I won't talk about what they're doing to that stuff in the mastering, but just as, as a recording playback format, um, it certainly has the resolution of vinyl. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any, personally, I don't think there's an argument about that, mm -hmm. but there's still this thing about the vinyl that you're not going to get without some kind of a plug-in if they've made such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, that. I, I still will, will almost always pick the analog over the digital. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I just like the sound of it better. You know, so when I'm not talking accuracy, I'm just talking about how it, the sound, how yeah. it emotionally grabs me, you know? Yeah. Oh, look, can I tell you another story? Back in 2011, when I did the um, uh, box set of the Mahler symphonies for uh, the San Francisco Symphony, Okay. Did it directly for them. They released it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they, they did a, some kind of a Kickstarter or some kind of thing like that. They had to have enough sales before they even mastered it mm -hmm. to guarantee mm -hmm. that it was viable. Mm -hmm. And they got it and they did it. And I think they only put out, was it 100 sets or 500 sets? I don't remember, but it was a small, mm -hmm. relatively small release. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm working from original digital tapes. And the guy, uh, his name was Kaiser, I don't remember his first name, who kind of oversaw the project from, from the business standpoint, but he was an audiophile, he owned two turntables, and, and we had a lot of discussions. And Jack Vad, who was the recording engineer for most of that stuff, came down and worked with me on it. And uh, we spent an entire day cutting refs of you know, what we felt were going to be the problem parts on it. And we cut it virtually without compromise. Um, we made a couple small level changes just to bring up a couple of low movements and stuff like that. Um, we didn't do any limiting. We didn't do wow. any you know, processing really to it. And you know, the record was heavily scrutinized against the, the SACD. I can't believe how many people said they thought the vinyl sounded better in those comparisons. I'm and not surprised. And I'm even not Jack surprised Vad, the least. Yeah. Even Jack Vad came out and he said, you know, I forgot just how amazing vinyl can sound. You know, he'd been away from it for over a decade. You know, I, I funny you bring that up, Kevin. I, I, I you know, obviously, you know, uh, friends come and go and stuff, and they're all like, you know, oh wow, you know, I want to, you know, I want to hear this or I want to hear that or you know, ah, you know, I don't buy into the whole vinyl thing. I listen to digital, and I'm like, you know. You probably have never heard a, a great record and you know invariably i mean obviously i'll pull out your stuff i'll pull out other stuff one of the records that i play a ton for people is an original telearc of time warp that came out in 78 i think uh -huh. 79 right and it, it, it's it's a digital recording right they use right. that uh was it sound sound stream sound stream yep yep sound stream and man, the dynamics and the bass on the record are nothing like what's on the CD. I'd like to hear the vinyl. I've only got the CD of it. I'm telling you, Kevin, the vinyl sounds so oh, much I better. It. I believe it. So, so much better than the CD. 
And they're like, right. how can that be? This is like from the digital file. Hi, yeah. It was done from the, you know, the, the, the same mastery. I'm like, dude, I don't know. I, I mean, you heard it. It just sounds so much better. Yeah. Well, I haven't heard that comparison, but yes, I've heard that comparison on other records and yeah, yeah. It's, it's apples and oranges. Amazing. Truly amazing. It, it, it's kind it, of a shame that the CD came out when it came out. If they had waited, eh, it would have been close to a decade. Yeah. People would have been hit with something much better, but yeah. you know, no whatever, doubt. evolution. It yeah. doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, save us from the CD. If they put it out too early. I, I probably agree. It's for sure. That's right. But doesn't change anything it was a dominating media for 25 30 years mm. and it almost destroyed vinyl mm. almost. yes mm. yes now vinyl is much bigger than the cd isn't that funny <laughs> it's so I, funny. See, crazy I, I wish i had a crystal so ball crazy. i never i never could have predicted that yeah but, but come on look look at that the i know jacket. i know it, it's it, it's something Leonardo da Vinci would, would say it, it, it's, it's, a it's, it's a work of art. It's a work of art. Yeah, it, it, it is. It can't get better. It can't get better. <laughs> yeah, right. Perfect. It's simply perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it will stay for the next decade at least. Or do you I, know of a, of a secret technology which can't No, <laughs> no I, I, you know, I, I, I love vinyl. I want to see it continue. Um, it's been very, very good to me. So... I, I think the vinyl's going to be around. You are one of the main uh, protagonists uh, who, who your share uh, or your 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 influence in the in the in, in of vinyl again is is a big part on your side, of course. Mm. Yeah, because I always discuss with people, and I think collecting vinyl in the seventies, sixties, mm. early eighties is in a way something completely different than collecting vinyl nowadays mm, because right. back then there was no alternative yeah of course yeah. i get a, a vinyl right what else? audio cassette maybe but come on only for the car but nowadays it's it's something because of just because of the quality because it's a terrible inconvenient product mm -hmm. <laughs> hey yes. you know what i, I always say screen, it, it, the, the there's a reason why Voyager One and Voyager Two have a vinyl record on them, right? And, and it's well, they have a gold they have a gold record, the gold yes. record, right? But you know, <laughs> yeah. there's a reason they have that on it, there, then. right? I mean, it's it. like it's 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 such a genius um, playback medium uh -huh. that you know it, it's so simple. And yet it contains so much information and it can sound so incredibly high fidelity. Um, you know, I, I, I sincerely doubt that in 30 years time, you're going to be able to play back a 24 bit 192 recording. I could be wrong, but I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh -huh. vinyl record, nope. you're always going to be able to play it back. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's I I could tell you the whole history of that of that Voyager record, too. That would be a whole other Zoom meeting. But uh, I was kind of in on that, too. Really? Yeah, I, I didn't do it, but I was working for Location Recording Service and uh, Steve Guy cut it. And there is nothing but misinformation about that record on the NASA site. I don't know where they got that info. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you why, you know, uh, Richard Heiser, the guy who invented uh, time delay spectrometry for audio, you know, uh, for, for measuring loudspeakers in rooms. Um, he worked at JPL um, and Carl Sagan came directly to him because he was an audio technical guy and said, uh, we want to do this. And, and Richard was like, hey, OK, that sounds cool. He went to a Hollywood Sapphire Group meeting and said, Hey, we're going to do a record and put it up in space. Anybody want to do it? And Steve Guy said, "Yeah, I'll cut it." That's how <laughs> wow. the whole thing went. Yeah. Wow. True story. Oh, the True story. It's amazing. I love it. They, didn't they just put that record out? I, I want to say like they've been talking about it for years. Did it finally happen? I think so. I think it just came out a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, uh, uh, I mean, they put out the audio from it on a CD. Yes. But you mean they put it out as a phonograph record? Yep. Yep. Awesome. I want one. Yep. 
<laughs> they, they put it out and, and um and, and I forgot, it, it, again, it kind of brought back this whole thing. A, a friend of mine asked me, it's like, dude, is this for real? Like, they, they, they had a record? There's a record up in space? I'm like, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. He's like, well, I don't get it. Why didn't they send a digital file? I'm like, dude. <laughs> there weren't any. Of, yeah, exactly. It was 1977, right? Right, right. You know, yeah. so, I mean, but yet a record, you know, who, whoever has, you know, a, 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 some level of intelligence Right, they're going to be able to figure out how to play it back. Well, it has right in sort of stick figures on it how to play it because it's analog. You know, they're showing that it spins and you put the yep. needle on it. You know, yep. how do you explain will, to somebody to play, how to play a digital file because they would probably have a totally different way of encoding the, the in, you know. The but it doesn't if there isn't a Kevin Gray in the deck. Is that one? <laughs> it's not yeah. audio file. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. Okay. All right. Well, this okay. has been very fun, guys. Awesome. You have been amazing. It's so amazing. You know, I've been doing my channel now one year. Last year, one one would have told me uh, you will talk to Kevin Gray in a year. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> it's it's well, such well, an honor. Thank Kevin, you. you're awesome. With us. Hey, thanks. Thanks, guys. No, it's uh, it's been a blast. Sincerely and thanks so much it. for all the beautiful mu music you provide us. Yes. With. Well, really uh, cool. you're most welcome. It's uh, especially when, when you talk about the Blue Note stuff, it's been a labor of love because I've always yeah. loved that music. So, yeah. you know, people ask me to this day, don't you get tired of doing all that Blue Note stuff? It's like, no, nope. <laughs> bring it on. It's timeless. Bring it on. It's yeah. timeless. Yeah, but, uh, but the running game between Danny and me, and I said, I was, you know, I think Kevin Gray, when his phone rings, he thinks, Oh, please don't let me do another sidewinder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might say that, you know, I think three times is enough on any of these, but, uh, but uh, particularly a new tile, I'd always be happy to, to do yeah, that. There's a plenty of coming. I, I think this, 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 um, to go back to the beginning in a way, this tone poet series is so important in so many ways. Right. And, yeah. and they I mean, provide us. You're talking about about uh, uh, you know being surprised on vinyl sales and and on on the longevity of the record. What blows my mind is if you go to the Amazon jazz charts, we've had seven of the ten on there for like the last year. Incredible. And I think we have number one and two this week. Incredible. So incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who'd who'd have thunk in 2021? Yeah. You know. Yeah. More Karen, to come. Please. Keep them coming. Please. All right. We need we need your stuff. I appreciate that very much. Thanks, I really, Kevin. I really, really do. You know, Thanks I don't I don't much. I don't take any accolades for granted. I really don't. I really appreciate that people appreciate what I do. You know, I, I do. I think Absolutely. I'm honored. Thanks so much, okay. Kevin. You're most welcome. Thank you. We'll talk soon, guys. I hope I'm the end All right, take care. Yeah. Now, now we, are, we are private now again. Yes, and now the outtakes, here so. comes Porter. This was brilliant. People hey, will love it. People will love it. <laughs> yeah. So excited. Yeah. Great.